Good evening. And welcome again to another awesome and exciting adventure in the Word of God. I come to you on behalf of the pastor and the membership of New Life Ministries Church in the name of the Lord to share with you what I believe God has placed on my heart to share to his people, to encourage them, to strengthen them, and to empower them to walk in victory and to overcome whatever obstacles or challenges the enemy might throw in their lives. I want you to, as the scripture told the, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, when they were suffering from the attacks of the fiery serpents and God told Moses to make a brazen serpent and lift it up and those that would look up would look up and live. Those that refused to look up would not live. And um, so as the scripture told them, look up and live. And then Jesus said, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So I want to encourage you to look up, lift up your heads. As the psalmist says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. The King of glory is coming through. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. So we're going to lift up our heads and look to Jesus. As we go before him in prayer, asking for his anointing in this message tonight. Father, we thank you in the name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for your awesome and tremendous blessings that you have bestowed upon each of us. We thank you for keeping us, for delivering us. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives and the love that you have bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And Father, I ask that you would anoint these lips of clay that I would be an oracle of your will and of your word to your people, and that they will be encouraged, empowered, and strengthened to walk vict victoriously in this present life so that they might please you in all things. I ask this in the name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. I want you to go with me to the letter of Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, the book of Romans. I'm going to go to the 8th chapter, and we're going to begin at the 15th verse. We're in a day and a time when it seems everywhere we turn and we look, there is so much hopelessness and seemingly helplessness. It seems like circumstances are setting the, the stage for us in, in uh, determining uh, how our life is going to uh, play out. But I want you to know that if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, circumstances will not master you, but you are able to master circumstances. If you look at the life of Jesus that he uh, set for us, the example he set for us when he was here in the Gospels, we see that Jesus never let circumstances master him, but he mastered circumstances. No matter what was going on, no matter what was happening, when Christ stepped into the room, things changed. And likewise with you, that same spirit that was in him is in you. He gave that spirit to us. He said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will talk to the Father and he will send you another comforter. Another paracletos, one who comes alongside. Another, I like the way the old folks used to call him, a consolator. And uh, we look back in Isaiah when he talks about his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, or Consolator. He's a consolation, a consolation to us. He's the one that, that strengthens us, that encourages us, that inspires us. And... Uh, He's right there with us alongside. He's got our six, as the army says. Uh, he's our wingman, as the Air Force would say. Uh, that's Jesus. And that's Jesus through the Holy Spirit. That's how he operates, through his spirit in our lives. But he has set us free. He has given us, we just celebrated 
uh, July 4th, and I know they're in the, in the politics ticks and stuff and there are people out there that say well I'm not celebrating July 4th well that's fine that's your choice you go ahead and help yourself but guess what get out of my way I'm going to celebrate Independence Day not because of what happened in 1776 or in even in uh, 1787 when the Constitution was established but I'm celebrating Independence Day because of something that happened 2,000 years ago that became effective in my life on May the 28th uh, 27th 1968 when I was set free from sin shame and I was given hope in Jesus Christ and I was made a child of the King oh bless his name I'm so happy to be able to express that I'm celebrating Independence Day every day it's not just on the 4th of July but every day is Independence Day for me because of Jesus Christ in the 15th verse of the 8th chapter in the book of Romans, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to be uh, bound and, 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 and encumbered, uh, and, and not able not able to have any strength or, or power to do what we need to do. You didn't receive that again. But Christ got rid of that and gave you instead the spirit, the dunamos. He said, you shall receive power in, in Acts, the, the first chapter. He said, you shall receive power. And that word power there, the Greek word is dunamos. And, and we get, uh, it's similar to what we get from our word dynamite. Dunamos, it's an explosive power. It's something that is unleashed in a moment uh, that, that's, that, that's, that is set free to, to explode and to do what it needs to be done. Uh, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And so when we receive this spirit of adoption, it enables us to cry unto God as Father. Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. We can cry out to him as his children. Now, if you haven't received Christ, you haven't received the Spirit of God. And if you haven't received the Spirit of God, you can't call him Father. He won't answer you. He won't respond to you. You call him Father. You can recognize him as God, but you can't recognize him as Father. You can't get that intimate and personal with him because you don't have a relationship with him. And the only way you can have a relationship of a, of a child with the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is through him that the adoption papers were drawn up and we were enabled to become sons of God. The Spirit himself, verse 16, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit himself, the Spirit said, yes, that, that, that's one. That, that one over there, that's, that's one. All of this. Paul, the same Paul tells Timothy, the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. He says in verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. Indeed, we suffer together so that we may also be glorified together. So no matter what you're going through right now, get your eyes off of what you're going through. You say, well, Brother Avon, I, I don't have any, my, my finances are jacked up. Or you say, uh, I'm dealing with some health problems and situations. Or I'm dealing with relationship problems. My, my significant other is not acting right. And, and nothing in my own job that have given me problems and things like that. Get your mind off of those things. Yeah, they, they're there. They, they're real. They're there. But don't put your focus on them. Focus on what's lifted up. The one that's, that's lifted up. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Lift up your eyes upon him. And the writer of Hebrews said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's who we look to. That's what you look at. Look at him. 
And he'll lead you out of that situation. He'll lead you out of the out of the challenges of your finances. He'll lead you out of the situation with your health. He'll lead you. You you no longer be sick and 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 uh, and and needing healing. He will heal you, but he'll also lead you into the path of health. So you not only be healed, but he will give you health so you don't have to need healing anymore. You'll walk in complete healing and continual health. Because you have an inheritance. An inheritance that is granted unto us through Jesus Christ. We're joined as with him. So whatever the Father has given him also has been given to us. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the coming glory to be revealed in us. So no matter what you're going through, no matter how challenging it is, no matter how daunting of a task it is, and it seems like unaccessible or, or un, uh, you seem like there's no way you're going to ever get the victory out of it. Don't give up hope. Don't throw your hands up. Don't give in. Don't give over, don't give out, but keep your eyes on Jesus knowing that he's got it in control. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits the unveiling of the sons of God. Not only uh, are you a child of the king, but also all creation is looking at you. All of creation, the stars, the moon, the earth that you walk upon, all of that is waiting earnestly to be delivered from the effects of sin. You hear people talk about climate change and all that stuff. Let me tell y'all something. Climate change is not the deal that's going to uh, uh, destroy us. God's got this under control. God is set up. And with all of our little models, the computer models that we put in and, and all the data we try to put in and try to figure out what's going to happen and whatever, and all, it's a fool's errand. That's what it is. Because God is the one that has a thermostat. God is the one that set up the system that we have that we call weather. God set it up. And no matter how we might predict, no matter what we might, we know even from just Ordinary, uh, everyday occurrences, when they'll predict rain and rain don't happen. And then they'll predict a clear sky and down comes a, a downpour. It's, it's not an exact science. It's still, that's why they predict. But God is the only one that knows exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. As I said, purposed, not accidental. Look at this. Creation eagerly awaits the unveiling of the sons of God. They're looking for you to, to be able to step into your full destiny, into your full purpose. It's not by accident that you're going through what you're going through right now. It's not accidental that you have gone through what you have gone through in the past. All of those things were allowed to happen to you and designed to happen to you to bring you to a point of a purpose that God has set up that ultimately he's going to be glorified in your life. And not only will he be glorified in your life, but you will also be glorified. As the psalmist says, for he is my glory and the lifter upper of my head. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but on account of him who subjected it in hope. In other words, let me put it another way. The creation was subjected to the degradation that you see around you, that things are not working perfectly. Uh, even in the seasons, things uh, uh, there are things that happen that is that is not in season. It's unseasonal. Uh, it might be unseasonably warm, or unseasonably cool, or unseasonably dry, or unseasonably wet. There's no way of of really tacking it down and saying, okay, this is how it's going to happen consistently all the time. Things change, and all. But it was all done. Uh, on account of him who subjected it in hope. In other words, uh, it was purposed. God set a purpose for all these things happening. 
Because even the creation itself, verse 21, shall be freed from the slavery, the bondage of corruption into the freedom. And that corruption means degradation, the, the, the degrading of creation, the breaking down of creation. Uh, you, you might have seen someone uh, pass and, uh, and 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 no one is living in that house anymore and all and it's like very quickly the house goes down as long as nobody is living in there it goes down it, it degrades very quickly and before long it's in ruins and you say well what happened there because that's in the environment the environment is was made subject to degradation the scientists have a word for that they have a name for that and they call it uh, entropy. That's what things break down to the smallest denomination. It breaks down. But in order to, we got the first and second law of thermodynamics and, and, and it says, it talks about to combat entropy, there has to be uh, heat. That's why I call it thermodynamics. And heat is caused by work or by energy. Energy is, is, is generated. And that means that in order for something to not degrade, something has to work against it. Well, unless it's the power of God working against it, sin brings things down. That's why in your life, unless the power of God is working in you against the effects of sin, you're going to be degraded. Okay, verse 21 again, because even the creation itself shall be freed from the slavery of corruption, degradation, entropy, into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You're the answer to climate change. You're the answer to the degradation that's going on in creation. For we know, verse 22, that all the creation groans together and labors in birth together until now. When you look around and you see the earthquakes, you see the volcanoes, you see all of the things that are, are happening, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the storms, all the things that are happening. Uh, you see the forest fires, all this. When you look at it, you look at destruction and you say, how can that be purpose? How, what's, 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 what's going on there? But even when you see the forest fire come through and everything is burned up, you see the rainfall that comes after that and you see that there are little shoots start popping up through the soil and there is a regeneration that's, that happens and the earth is renewed as a result of the destruction. It's renewed. Who did that? God designed it that way. And likewise, when we are degraded and we are buried, we're going to be regenerated. We're going to come up out of that grave. We're going to be regenerated into new bodies. The Bible uses a the word there, metamorphosis. We shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This, this corruption will put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. Thank you, Jesus. But the volcanoes, the earthquakes, that's like being the earth being in labor pains. Creation is being in labor. You look out into the cosmos and you see the uh, supernovae and you see uh, different uh, 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 pulsar stars and, and different uh, uh, things going on out there. Uh, it's groaning. It's in labor, waiting for you to be manifested in the real you to the purpose that God has set for you. I want to tell you something. If you don't get anything else, God's got a purpose for you, and it's not accidental. It's not, it's not a second thought or an afterthought. It is a purpose that he has, has set up for you and designed for you before the foundation of the world, before he created anything. God had a plan for you and for your life. Stop listening to these, these folks that don't know anything about it, about really what's happening. They're in the same boat as you. So how do they know what's really happening? You need to listen to someone who is beyond the boat. And that's God. Someone who is not confined by time or space. Solomon said this, that even the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. So you need to listen to someone who created it all, that knows all. 
and that's God. And he has given us his word and his assurance that he's with us and he will never leave us or forsake us. Verse 23, and not only that, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit. That's a capital S. In other words, the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. And we go over to uh, Galatians and he talks about the, the fruit of the spirit. And he labels the fruits. He, he, he lays them out there, the fruits of the spirit. So we have the first fruits of the spirit. Love, peace, joy, he goes on down the line. Look at this. Even we ourselves, grow, and, and let me tell you something, our love, our peace, our joy is not like that that you find in the world. It's not like that that's produced by human uh, production, a human concept. concept. But it is totally different. It is something that is produced where you have joy even in the midst of sorrow. You have peace even in the midst of chaos. The world can't produce that. But the Spirit of God can. Even we ourselves, verse 23, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting adoption, the redemption of our body. We've already been changed. Our spiritual DNA has been changed into the DNA, spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ. Peter said it this way. We have been made partakers of the divine nature. That means our spiritual DNA has been changed. And then Paul said it another way in his letter to uh, the Corinthian church. I believe it's uh, the third chapter of 1 Corinthians where he says that are you not carnal and behave as and, and the literal translation there is mere men, meaning which implies that you are not mere men. You're not supposed to be like everybody else. But you're a different type of man, even to the extent that when the disciples, after Christ uh, stilled the, the storm and said, peace be still, they looked around and said, what kind of man is this? That's how folks should be looking at you. What kind of folk is this? Who are these folks? That's what they said about Paul and Barnabas when they, when they said about them. They said, these are the men that have turned the world upside down. And really, they hadn't turned the world upside down. They was actually turning the world right side up because sin turned the world upside down. But we are eagerly awaiting adoption and redemption of our body. In other words, this old body that sin dwells in will be exchanged for a body that is holy and perfect and matches a body that matches our spiritual DNA, our spirit and our soul that he has saved. So that, so that uh, as he has delivered us through his death on the cross, he delivered us from the condemnation of sin or from the, the, the uh, uh, judgment of sin. And the Holy Spirit now through sanctification is, is uh, separating us from the effects or the power of sin. When he comes and gives us our redeemed body, we will be removed from the presence of of sin totally and completely verse 24 but by this hope we were saved but hope that is seen is not hope so don't 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 get discouraged because you don't see everything worked out yet because you don't see everything that's going on let me ask you this when you sit down at McDonald's and you grab a Big Mac and you bite into that Big Mac and and begin to enjoy and savor the taste of that Big Mac. Are you able to see everything that the effects, everything that that Big Mac does when it goes down into your system? No, you don't see everything that it does. And some things that it does later, you don't see until later. All you know is that you're, you're hungry right now, and you're eating it right now, and you're consuming it right now. And so the effects of that or the results of that, the product of all of that will come later. Likewise, that's what Paul is saying here. You're saved now, but you don't see the full effect of that salvation as it's going to be. It's, there's a process, and that process is going to work itself out to the purpose that God has set for it. So he says this, for by this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. 
For why does one still hope for what he already sees? You're not hoping for something that you already can see. No, hope, when you put that, uh, click on that, that button to order something or online or whatever, or you send off that check in the mail, you know, you haven't seen that product yet in your hands. You have hope that it's going to come. But when it gets there, what do you do? You open a wrapper, you look at the product, and you got it right there. You don't need to be looking in the mailbox anymore. It's done. Your hope is over with because you have it. So hope that is seen is not hope. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await it with endurance. You wait for the package to come. As a matter of fact, when you sign that check or you click on that button with your credit card or whatever to pay for it, and, your, and it says your order is complete and, is, and will be shipped, at that point, it's almost as if you've already got it in your hands, even though you don't. You're still hoping. You're still waiting. You're still looking for it. But you act like it's as if you've already, it's a done deal. Because there's nothing else for you to do until it comes. Likewise, there's nothing else for us to do about our salvation until it comes. Until it's fully manifest. Another, let me put it another way. When I say nothing else for us to do about our salvation, I mean it from this standpoint. You can't add any more. You can't, you can't add to the salvation that Christ has provi provided for you. And it will be manifested eventually in, in the time that he has set. The only thing you do with the salvation is you walk in it. You work in it. You work it out. In other words, you allow it to work itself out. You allow that salvation process to work itself out and be manifested in you to the glory and honor of God. And we do that with endurance. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. The Spirit prays prayers that you don't even hear. You listen to yourself pray. and all, But you're hitting and missing. You, you, you're putting out there what you think should be said what you think you need but the holy spirit knows what you need he knows what you have need of because he does this look at this but he that searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes on behalf of the saints according to the will of god according to god's purpose and it's not accidental and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together. Everything that has happened in your life, even though the, the, the folk that were doing it, or the, 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 the devil that was planning it, or, or plotting it, or, 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 or uh, setting strategy for it, all those things, might have been working. They might have been set and planned to destroy you. But God got in there. God got into the details and made it work for good. Look at that. We know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who love God, according to those who are called according to his purpose. Let me say it another way. We bring it down to your level. And that's this. If you get some uh, baking soda, taste it. Just did a big teaspoon of baking soda and put it in your mouth. Yuck. Uh, if you get some uh, milk, some buttermilk, and, and uh, just a cup of that and, and drink it. Some of you might like buttermilk, and a lot of people that I've run into don't like it. Uh, so you spit that out. Um, and maybe some shortening and all just get a big spoon of that uh, a couple of spoons of that and put it in your mouth that's that's nasty and whatever uh, and maybe some eggs and in big few cups of flour and just 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 turn it up and and start chowing down on it. that's now those things in and of themselves separately 
don't taste good. But you put all those things together, mix them all up together, and put them in, you can take and put your hand in that oven, heat it at a certain degree, that don't feel good. But you take those things and put them all in there with that heat and put them together on a baking sheet and put it in together. And after a certain amount of time and endurance, you pull those babies out and you got some nice biscuits. And then you can tear those biscuits up and they taste good. But they taste good because all of those different things work together for the good biscuits that you're enjoying that were designed by you to enjoy. Likewise, all things work together for good to those who love God. And look at this. This is, a, this is a, the uh, clincher. Those who love God. All things don't work together for good to everybody. But it says for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, because whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God has purposed and designed you and me to be like Jesus. That's what he's saying, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God is making up a family. And John tells us in 1 John, the third chapter, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And then it goes down and he tells us, says, uh, Right now it might not seem like we're the sons of God. But now we're the sons of God. It might not seem like it, but he tells it like this. He says, But when we see him, we shall know him because we shall be like him. We're going to know him as he is. Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. God predestined, God uh, purposed. For, so it's not accidental. God purposed and then he designed, he called. He sent out, called you by name. He said, this is the one. I'm, I'm picking this one out, that one out, this one here. And so he, whom he, he predestined, those are the ones that he called. And whom he called, these he also, he justified. He saved us. And whom he justified, these also he glorified. He's already set up for your glory, for you to be manifested as his sons. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Stop worrying about who's fighting against you. The battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. Sister Rhonda preached on Sunday. Uh, the battle is from by Jehoshaphat, and it was right on, right on the money, spot on. The battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. Stop fearing, stop walking in fear, being afraid, afraid of COVID, afraid of, of uh, monkeypox and all these other uh, diseases, afraid of, of the stock market crash, and afraid of, of your bank account closing, afraid of all, walking in fear. Stop walking in fear. Afraid that your spouse is going to leave you. Afraid that your children going going to disown you, not want to do anything. Stop worrying about stuff like that. Focus on the fact that God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's where you put your focus on. And I guarantee you, when you start focusing that way, the, the, the fear goes away. When you start really looking at what Jesus has did, done for you and accomplished for you and what God has purposed for you, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. The peace of God, the past of all understanding will be yours. Jesus said, I give you peace not as the world gives you. And when you start focusing on him, you'll have unspeakable joy. You'll walk in righteousness. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He's given him to us, and he's also going to give us freely all things that accompany Christ. Who shall bring an accusation against God's elect? Elect means that God chose you. Who gonna bring, who's going to be able to bring an accusation against you? It is God who justifies they can they can accuse the devil is the accuser of the of the brother <coughs> excuse me 
The devil is accused of a brother all the time. He's always accusing. But guess what? He's overruled. All his accusations are overruled because of the blood of Jesus. Who is he that condemns us? Christ is the one having died, but rather also having been raised, who is even at the right hand of the Father, who also intercedes on our behalf. So who is going to be able to condemn you if Christ says in this first verse in this, this same chapter, the eighth, eighth chapter in Romans says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So he's interceding on our behalf. He's saying, Father, that's mine. She's mine. He's mine. So who's going to condemn you? The only one that has a right to condemn is Christ. So if he doesn't condemn, nobody else has a right to. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are put to death the whole day long. We are counted as sheep for slaughter. But look at this. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. But my finances are jacked up. I'm still a conqueror. But my relationships are breaking apart. I'm still a conqueror. But my body is acting up. I'm still a conqueror. But they're threatening me on my job. Yeah, they're threatening a conqueror. More than a conqueror. Verse 38, for I am convinced, and this is what you need to do. You need to be convinced. I am convinced. And then the King James Version says persuaded, but it means convinced. Uh, I'm persuaded or I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Are you convinced? If you're not, talk to yourself and get convinced. Make up in your mind. That you're going to do what God has said you are to do. And I'm going to close with this. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 27, where it says, Nothing can stop God's plan for your life. Nothing can stop God's plan for your life. In verse 27 of the 14th chapter of Isaiah, it says, For what the holy God has purposed, not accidental, who shall frustrate and who shall turn back his uplifted hand? If God has lifted his hand up for you, nobody can move that hand. Nobody can stop it. If God has reached out to help you. Nobody can hinder him from helping you. You're purposed and you're not accidental. Father, we thank you for what you have done in our lives and what you have spoken concerning our destiny. We thank you for what you are going to do. We thank you for what you have done. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. For it is all by your hand. Not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. You have done all of these things for us. And we look to you and we glorify you and we bless you. We bless your name. We lift up your name. And we just thank you, Lord. We love you so much. And I pray for these, your people, that you withhold not any good thing from them, but keep them as the apple of your eye. And, oh, Father, make plain paths for their feet, that they may walk upright before you and glorify you in everything that they do. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. God bless you, saints. Until next time, go with God.